In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Lord, bless us, amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, ever, amen. O Lord, make us worthy, pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever, amen. Let us give thanks to the grace and the merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, for us protected, assisted, preserved, and accepted us, had compassion upon us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Almighty God, to keep us in peace this blessed day and all the days of our life. O Lord, Master and Almighty God, the Father of our Lord, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we thank you on every occasion and every condition and for all things, for you have protected, assisted, preserved, accepted us, had compassion upon us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and appeal to your goodness, a lover of mankind, that you grant us to conclude this blessed day and all the days of our life, in peace and in your fear, all envy, all temptation, all works of Satan, all intrigues of the wicked, rising up of the enemy, seen and unseen, do cast away from us and from all your people and from this holy place. Grant us the endowments and benefactions, as you have given us the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through the grace, mercy, and love of mankind, of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, glory, honour, and dominion, and worship are due to you, together with him, the life-giving, consubstantial Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. They may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part you are making to know wisdom. Purge me with this, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to joy and gladness of the bones you have a broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my goodies. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and you in a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and upon me the generous spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For do not desire a sacrifice, or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Fill the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar, Alleluia. The prayer of the eleventh hour of this blessed day is offered to Christ my King and my God, beseeching him to forgive my sins. From the sons of our teacher David the prophet and King, may his blessing be with us all, amen. Uh, Psalm 123. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eye of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of their mistress, so that our eyes look to the Lord our God, until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with content. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Alleluia. Psalm 126. When the Lord was brought the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Alleluia. Psalm 129. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, yet have not prevailed against me. The plough is ploughed on my back. They made their furrows long. The Lord is righteous. He has cut in pieces the cause of the wicked. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. Let them be on the grass of the housetops, on which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves his arms. 
Neither let those who pass by them say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. May his blessing be with us all. Amen. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and served them. Now when the sun was setting, all those had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Glory be to God for our amen. Ten oshtem moko pe chrestos nem pe kyo ten aga tos nem pe ab nevma et awem je ak i exoti emonaina. Amen. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall I, the sinner, appear? Because of my human weakness, I cannot bear the burden and the heat of the day. But you, the merciful God, count me among those of the eleventh hour. In sin my mother conceived and gave birth to me. I should not dare look up to heaven, but because of your great mercy and love to humanity, I call to you, saying, Lord, forgive my sins and have mercy upon me. Take me now, my Saviour, into your fatherly embrace, because I have spent my life in pleasures and desires. My time is running out. Now I depend on your rich and infinite compassion. Do not disregard our humble heart and age of mercy. I cry to you with reverence. I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. <laughs> I practice evil with diligence and enthusiasm, with earnestness and keenness I committed each sin. For this I deserve suffering and condemnation. Our Lady Virgin Mary, guide me to a means of repentance. To you I plea, through you I seek supplication. I call for your help, lest I fail. Come to my rescue when my soul departs from my body. Defeat the conspiracy of the enemy. Shut the gates of hell, lest they swallow my soul. O blameless bride of the true Lord. Lord, hear us and have mercy upon us. Kiri aleisum, kiri aleisum, kiri aleisum. Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, Kiria lay son, son, Kiria lay son. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. God the Father Almighty, have mercy upon us. O Holy Trinity, have mercy upon us. O Lord, God of hosts, be with us, for we have no other support in our tribulations and adversary but you. O God, was wrong, forgive us our sins, who is done willingly and unwillingly, and those which we have committed knowingly and unknowingly, the hidden and visible. O Lord, forgive us for the sake of your holy name that is called upon us and according to your mercy and not to our sins. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, compassionate Lord, for you granted us to pass a day in peace and brought us thankfully to the night and made us worthy of seeing your light until sunset. Accept this glorification we now offer. Save us from the temptations of the enemy and defeat all these traps set against us. In this coming night, give us peace without pain or anxiety or fatigue or illusion so we may pass through the night in peace and chastity and awake to praise and pray to you at all times and everywhere. We glorify and praise your name, your Father and the Holy Spirit, forevermore. Amen. Have mercy upon us, O God. Have mercy upon us. For you are worshipped and glorified in heaven and on earth. O Christ, our good Lord, plenteous us in patience, mercy and compassion, who loves the just and shows mercy to all sinners amongst whom I am the first, who does not wish death for the sinner, but repentance and life, calling us all to salvation for the promised forthcoming rewards. O Lord, accept our prayers of this hour and every hour. Ease our lives and guide us to act according to your commandments. Sanctify our souls, purify our bodies, set right our thoughts, cleanse our intentions, heal our sicknesses, forgive us our sins, and deliver us from every evil grief and distress. Surround us with your holy angels that we may be guided and guarded with them to attain the unity of faith and knowledge of your acceptable and infinite glory. For your blessed forever. Amen.
allowing us to partake of your holy body and your precious blood this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this lovely gathering. Help us, Lord, to learn something today about your beautiful sacrament of marriage. Keep in this time of Lent. Send no fear in all your heavenly saints and angels. Heal us, Lord, when we pray. Thank you, sing our Father, who art in heaven. Come. Blessed day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespasses against us. Deliver us from evil, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. All right, hello everyone. Do Sunday night youth meeting. Um, today we will try a new hymn. Some of you might know it. It's called In the Midst of the Raging Sea. You might have heard it. I think I've only heard it in Arabic, to be honest. But it's beautiful. So if you know it, sing along. If not, I'll just do, I sing it once, and then it's kind of a repetition. Sorry, I can't explain it. Just, yeah, cool. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. In the midst of the raging sea, there I was sailing. The waves were pounding me, making me afraid.
creeping night has threatened my peace, and the tears have not left my eyes, and the tears have not left my eyes, and the sleepless nights have Jesus, when he saw me, came to me quickly. In my despair and darkness, he opened my eyes. When I saw him, I cried, have mercy. When I saw him, I cried, have mercy. I took the oar and start rowing, but my hopes have failed. My weakness and my ignorance brought more grief to me. And my Lord at the shore sees me, and my Lord at the shore sees me. to me and restore my high hope. When will you come to me and restore my hope? Jesus, when he saw me, came to me quickly in my despair and darkness. He opened my I saw him, I cried, have mercy. When I saw him, I cried, have mercy. He came to me quickly and had mercy on me. He came to me quickly and had mercy on me. I was in despair and drowning, and my hope is torn. I came to my lover Jesus, offering him my tears. When he saw me, he had compassion on me. When he saw me, he had compassion on me. He stretched out his sweet hand and then dried my tears. He stretched out his sweet hand and dried my tears. Jesus, when he saw me, came to me quickly in my despair and darkness. He opened my eyes. When I saw him, I cried, have mercy. When I saw him, I cried, have mercy. He came to me quickly and had mercy on me. He came to me quickly and had mercy on me. Hello everyone, welcome to another fun field Sunday night. Um, before we get started with our main talk, we have a pre-talk from our very own Carol. Can we please welcome her up?
Um, yeah, so last week we had Nermeen and Phoebe come to talk about the Coptic Orphans trip that's coming up. Uh, so this week I was asked to talk about my experience because I did this trip two years ago now. Wow. Um, honestly, one of the best experiences that I had, like, ever. Uh, you don't expect, a, like, I didn't expect it to be that emotionally touching, to be honest. I kind of thought I was going to Egypt, you know, got to see family, got to have, like, got to go places I never went and, you know, meet kids and stuff. But honestly, it really does touch your heart. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about what the trip's actually, like, how it ran. Uh, I believe Phoebe is also going to be talking to people today. I don't know what's happening, but... So, yeah, I'm just going to explain how, like, what we did on this trip. Um, so, it's an opportunity to volunteer uh, in Egypt for three weeks. So, you bond with these children as well as get to know the real Egypt. There's a lot of experiences. So it's not just services. You get, you get to have, like, a lot of outings as well. Um, yeah, and you also get to be a part of a close-knit team that teaches kids English and love of education. Um, a lot of these kids are, like, so it is rural villages and stuff, so it's not, it, it was actually a bit confronting for me. Um, I didn't really expect this going into it, but these kids actually have such a big, like, hunger and love of learning, and it's honestly amazing to see them learn new things. Um, so the program, there's three trips every year. There's two in winter, which is Egypt's summer break, uh, and then there's one in our summer. Uh, those are the dates that I believe for 2020, I'm sorry, I don't, this year was the first year that we started this, actually holidays was the first year that they started back up again since COVID hit, so these are running now. Anyone 17 and over can join these trips. Um, so how it ran, Monday to Friday morning, there's two classes that you teach, mainly English, but other things as well that I'll talk about. Um, so yeah, the first one is from 9 to 11, and then the second one ran from 12 to 2. You had a bit of a break in the middle to set up for the next class. Uh, yeah, the focus areas were educate and empower, uh, gender development, which is actually a lot worse in, like, you, it's very different, yeah, like, it, you don't understand how big of a gap there is back, especially in villages, like, even between Cairo and the villages, there's a, a big gap between there as well. Um, and even I was born in Egypt and I grew up there, but even that was a bit confronting for me. Uh, and health education. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday evenings, you get to visit these kids in their homes. Uh, honestly, they love it. They look forward to it every day and every day they're coming, oh, they come up to you and they ask, are you coming back to my house today? And honestly, they just love it so much. Uh, Wednesday evenings, you get to go on a local outing and Saturday is a combined outing. So you get split up into different locations, so not everyone will be together. Um, and then on the on Saturday, you get to combine all the groups and they go usually somewhere tourist. Uh, Sundays is a mass and some rest and free time, which trust me, you will need the rest at the end of the week. Um, yeah, so the focus areas, educate and empower. Um, so as the name suggests, they are orphans, it is Coptic orphans, so a lot of these Children either only have their mum, which orphan in Egypt generally refers to their father not being there, not both parents. Uh, some, of course, don't have either of their parents. Um, but despite some of the stories you hear and such hard things that these little children have been through, their faith and their love and they're honestly just amazing. You. Honestly, it makes you feel bad about your own faith sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you teach them English through creative workshops um, and you it also works with the community as well. Trust me, all the kids come back and they're like, oh, I told mum this and she never knew and stuff. I, like, it does impact beyond the kids. Um, gender development. So you have an opportunity to work with girls and young women participating in the Valuable Girl Project. Uh, teaching them English, encouraging female empowerment through mentorship and creation of space, safe spaces for open dialogue and mutual support. By, by the way, all these photos were actually from my trip. There's heaps more on the Coptic Orphans page, but this was just personal ones. Um, and health education was the third one. Uh, so you raise awareness about health uh, in local communities by leading classes focused on topics such as nutrition, hygiene and public health. 
and you get to bond with these lovely, lovely children. Honestly, they still touch my heart. These photos still warm me up inside. I love them so much. And of course, their love of stickers. Yeah, we, have, we bought so many stickers. Um, but yeah, so that, that was my experience. Honestly, I could not recommend it enough. Um, I believe Phoebe will talk about it later. I don't know how much detail she's going into, but yeah, that's all from me today. Thank you, Carol. I think um, I think that after last week, there was a lot of discussion about Coptic orphans, and a lot of people were very keen. So, um, if you do, if you are keen on on that trip, I think they um, it's, it's coming up very very soon, in July, I believe, June, July. June, July. Speak to Phoebe after she knows a lot better, more than I do about this. So tonight, guys, we're, we're, we're wrapping up our series, okay? We're wrapping up our series on marriage, yeah? So we were, in the beginning of this series, remember, we wanted to start talking about um, marriage rather than relationships, okay? So that we, we understand a little bit more about what we're getting into rather about how to get there. Um, we started off with a very embarrassing um, interview with a lot of our couples, myself included. Um, Kira was helping us or was interviewing us. Um, that was uh, not very informative, but it was interesting. <laughs> um, and then we started talking about the purpose of marriage and we started talking about a lot of other important things that a lot of our speakers talked about. So today we're ending it off with a bang. We're ending off with a really, um, a topic that a lot of us, we don't really talk about very much. Um, and it's not really spoken about very openly, which is why we really wanted to talk about it today, which is divorce, okay? And what our church's view is on divorce and stuff like that. It's a bit of a, of a, of a lull of an end to the, to the series, but I think it's an important one for us to all understand. And Wunder Mark is going to help us with that tonight. So thank you for welcome, guys. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So Monica teaches my son David at, at school. So I, I told him I'm going to um, Monica's church for a talk. He goes, I want to come, I want to come, I want to come. I go, all right, I'll come. Um, then I realized the topic is divorce. So I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he cried as I left, but um, Monica will make it up to him tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, someone read your um, poster and sent it to me, and it says the, the purpose of marriage is divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, it's definitely not our purpose. But, um, uh, you know, I think as we, as we begin to explore this topic of divorce, I think it's, it's good for us to understand, and you may have covered some of this already, but um, how we view marriage um, which gives us a bit more perspective on how we then view divorce. You know, um, the concept of marriage is uh, ancient, um, and it's as ancient as Adam and Eve. That when God created Adam, He looked to Adam, and He saw him, and He said, "It's not good for man to be alone." Um, and God then creates his helper Eve. And so you see from the very, very beginning of creation, by design, God has created humanity with this uh, desire to be in a relationship uh, and not to be alone. Of course, there are exceptions. There, there are the monastics and things like that. But generally speaking, the vast majority of us are created to be in a relationship, in a relationship with God and in a relationship with someone that I'll spend the rest of my life with. Um, and you see that when God um, creates this beautiful union between Adam and Eve, um, that this would then be the symbol of God's relationship with humanity. You know, when, when God presents himself to humanity, he does so in, in a number of ways. It's not a singular way. So, for example, God is our king. Yeah? Agree? 
But then he's also our judge. And then he presents himself to us as a shepherd. Then he says, no, when you pray, say, our father. So I'm a father. So who is God to us exactly? Is he a king? Is he a father? Is he a shepherd? He, call, he says that I'm your friend. And he calls us a friend. All these different titles that God and methods that God presents himself to humanity. You know, if, um, if you get a diamond, especially the girls, if you get a diamond, you know what you do? You don't just look at the diamond and go, oh, it's a nice diamond. You actually, like, you hold it up and you look at it from different angles and you put it in the light and you look how the light reflects and you explore the different faces of the diamond. Is that right? Why? Because th a diamond does not have one singular face, one singular angle. To, un to understand the diamond, to explore its beauty, you actually have to look at it from every single angle. And God is similar in a way. That God the Almighty cannot be understood. His relationship with us cannot be understood by a singular angle. God is our king. That's it. No. Look from this way. He's a father. Put, up him, put him up in the light. He's a friend. You put him here. He's a king. And, and it goes on and on and on. As you read through scripture, you find so many ways in which God is presenting himself to humanity. Because there's no one single way that can encompass God. Now, which of, the, which of God's titles do you think is the most repeated title in scripture? Throughout all the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Which angle does God present himself to us the most. Yeah. Bridegroom. Oh, boom. As the bridegroom. He presents himself to us as the bridegroom. Yeah. So the, the ultimate image of marriage, the benchmark that is pre presented to us in the, in the Coptic Orthodox ceremony, the readings that are read are about the relationship between Christ and the church. Yeah? Christ being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. And that is, that is the benchmark that is put for us. The ultimate marriage. The reason we need to start there is because that's, that's what all other marriages are based off. The marriage between Christ and the church. Christ the bridegroom, the church, the bride. Yeah? When you look at marriage in, in that way, you take a very different view of it. Yeah. So when we come to a topic like divorce, this is actually an easy topic. Because we don't really, um, it's not part of our vocabulary. Divorce is not really part of the equation for us. Because our, our view of marriage, our image of marriage is Christ and the church. And when you look at that image, you see our Lord, the bridegroom, giving his life for the bride, sacrificing himself completely, laying down his life selflessly. And you see the church in complete adoration to Christ, complete respect to Christ. It's this beautiful relationship between Christ and the church. And it's a relationship that is eternal. It was always there and it always will be. And so for marriage, when what's taking place is we're talking about here about a sacrament. And a sacrament in the church is a mystery in which something mysterious takes place. And the mysterious, there's a mysterious element to every sacrament. The Eucharist, what's the mysterious element? What takes place in the Eucharist? 
the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In baptism, what is the mysterious element taking place? That water is bestowed with power to give new life. Yeah. In marriage, what is the mysterious element? Two people walk down the aisle as two, stand before the altar, they leave as one. Something happens. Just like something happens in the Eucharist, something happens in marriage ceremony. They leave as one. Now that bond of becoming one is eternal. It goes even into heaven. Nothing separates it. Yeah. So, we don't really have divorce as part of our equation. Because the way we view marriage is a little bit different to the world. The way we view marriage is the way Christ viewed his relationship with the church. Which is that I am marrying somebody not because I've fallen in love. Not because she's hot. Not because he's cute. Not because he's a doctor. Like not because she's going to wash the dishes. Like why are you getting married? Why get married for? I can tell you now, it's not easy. Why do it? And I want you to think about that. Why get married? If you're married, why did you get married? You love them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy's heard my talk before. <laughs> That's the ultimate purpose of marriage is to go to God's kingdom. Now, I, I always use this example, but if you go to the monastery and you ask a random monk, hey, why did you come monk for? Like, without even thinking, he's going to say, oh, like, just so, so, you know, I, I wanted to go heaven, and this is my way of working out my salvation. Give my life to God, I'm going to go to the kingdom of heaven. You'll, you'll hear some variation of that answer. And they're, and they're very clear about it, like it's, it's pretty black and white. But go to any married person and say, hey, why'd you get married? No one knows. No one knows why they're married. If you find one person that gives you an answer because I wanted to go to heaven, I'll, I'll give them a thousand dollars. But you're not going to hear it. We've lost the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is heaven. <coughs> is a pathway to God's kingdom. Like the monastery and the desert is the arena for that monk to go to heaven, marriage is the arena for the married person to go to heaven. How is it an arena? How does it get us to heaven? Because it teaches us to be completely selfless. It teaches us to give our life for another. It refines our, our, our self for God's kingdom. And so, when you look at marriage in that way, that it's my pathway to God's kingdom, when you look at it that it is the ultimate sacrifice between Christ and the church, then marriage becomes a little bit different. It's not about taking something, but it's about giving something. It's not about getting my rights, but it's about laying down my life. It's not about what I can get out of it, but it's about the journey that I'm on to God's kingdom. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you find yourself married, and you love the person, as Monica was saying, you love them. 
Then you realize they're actually very annoying. <laughs> and you know what? I don't know what I saw in this person before. What do you do? Divorce? It's not part of our vocabulary. Now, there are going to be exceptions, which we'll talk about in a second. But generally speaking, we had one, one separation take place recently in the church. And I said, I was trying to talk to the, the wife about why she wants to end the, the marriage. She said, he's not an A-grade husband. Okay, not an A-grade husband, fair enough. What if you end up with a B-grade husband or a C-grade wife? What do you do? Feel free to like contribute with me. What do you do? Let's say you, girls, you marry a guy, and he doesn't work. No, 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 I'm just gonna play PlayStation all day. What do you do? Any ideas? Besides divorce, because it's not part of the vocabulary. <laughs> Good luck to you, man. <laughs> if we look at marriage with a spiritual lens, we'll use all of these situations to refine ourselves, to give more, to love more, to head towards God's kingdom. Because to love someone, to marry someone, is not an emotion, it's a decision. I am deciding to love you. I am deciding to lay down my life for you. I'm deciding to expect nothing but only to give. And I'm deciding to head towards God's kingdom and that everything that takes place in the marriage, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's loving, whether it's hurtful, whether it's selfish, everything can be used to refine myself for God's kingdom. So all of a sudden, marriage becomes a beautiful arena. Not something that I'm miserably stuck in. Yeah? Is this making sense? So we live in a world that, that portrays love and marriage in a certain way. You meet Prince Charming and he's gonna sweep you off your feet, and it's gonna be beautiful, we live in love and like and, and, and maybe that will happen. But it probably won't. So we're not, we're not following um, Hollywood, movies, society. We're following a kingdom. We're following Christ and his intention for us. Yeah. Now, there are, of course, exceptions which are obvious, like um, somebody commits adultery and cheats, well, then in that case, you have a situation where the marriage can be broken, can be irreparable, um, and then there is divorce from uh, government, and the church, that still doesn't use the word divorce, we don't use the word divorce, it's not in our vocabulary, but the church can give an absolution for remarriage in the case where that took place, or if there's domestic violence, in that case, a divorce can be sought from the government and the church can give absolution for remarriage. Um, so it's only extreme cases where a separation needs to take place. Yeah? But in most cases, the marriage can always be worked on. There can always be a solution. As long as we have that spiritual lens on, that spiritual view of marriage. Yeah? Now, this seems a little bit like a dull topic and all that, um, but marriage is beautiful. When you find the right person um, and you both have that spiritual goal, then it will be beautiful. Yeah. If both parties are selfless, it will be beautiful. When you're not seeking your own but looking for the other, it will be beautiful. When you're both in it because it's God came towards God's kingdom, it will be beautiful. Yeah? So be happy and be excited.
to get married, if you're not. Um, and don't stress about divorce, because not in our vocabulary. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen as long as you have your spiritual lens on. As long as you're always seeking God's help. Some of us may have come from families where there is divorce. Doesn't mean that's going to be our future. Doesn't mean we look badly at anyone who is divorced. Everyone has their own circumstances. It's fine. So I want to, um, on purpose, stop there early to give you a chance to, to ask your questions because um, I'm not sure if I've addressed the, what was running through your minds. So to give you a chance to um, ask your questions, I'll just make sure that I address what Monica said. She said, um, why does God hate divorce? Um, it's not in God's vocabulary. He doesn't hate it. He, it doesn't exist. Because what God has joined, no one can separate it. If a marriage is making me miserable, why would God want me to stay in this marriage? You don't have to be miserable. It's miserable if, if God's kingdom is not in front of you. Marriage being a sacrament, does that mean that it's unbreakable? Yeah. If I'm miserable in my marriage, what do I do if I'm not allowed to divorce? We'll realign to God's kingdom. All right, and any other questions? Yeah? Oh, you're heaps? Okay. So the first question is, um, can priests intervene if they do not think a marriage is suitable for a person's spiritual life? Uh, I'm not sure if this question means can they intervene before the marriage or after the marriage. Um, um, I'll assume it's after. Um, the priests intervene, yeah, in a, in a, in a way of trying to um, make the marriage a more spiritual one. That's the job of a priest, is to visit and to check up on people and to make sure the marriage is in the right direction. So in that sense, yeah, the priest would intervene. Is having a desire to start a family a bad reason to get married? No, because your desire to start a family is a natural desire that God has put in each of us. Yeah? And actually, this desire is a reflection of Him. Because we are created in God's image. Why did God create us? Any ideas? Because he loves us, right? So out of love, God has this burning desire to bring into the world humanity out of his burning love. Yeah? We are creating God's image. So we find ourselves all of a sudden with a desire to bring into the world to love. It's exactly like God. Um, so... Is it, is it wrong to want to start a family? Um, no, it's not wrong. <coughs> but, but if that's the only thing, then you may find yourself um, unhappy, unsatisfied. Because sometimes we think, if I find the right person, I'll be happy. So if I can find that one soulmate I spend the rest of my life with, and I can come home to, and then like I'll be fulfilled, and then I'll be happy, and you'll be absolutely disappointed. You'll be let down. Why? Because Christ is ultimately the one that fulfills us. Sometimes we expect from our partners to do the impossible for us, to make us feel happy and content. That's not their job. That's the job of God in our life. So have God as central, then you'll always be happy in your marriage. If the purpose of marriage is to go to heaven, does that mean that we don't need to be 100% compatible? You know, first of all, you'll never find someone 100% compatible. But what I suggest is go for the critical items that need to be compatible. There are critical things that have to be there to be compatible. 
And there are others that it doesn't really matter. It's okay to be different. Yeah? Like, for example, my wife likes to do the bed as soon as we get out of the bed. She likes to, like, do it up. I've never done the bed in my life. I, don't, I just walk out, of, I leave it in my bed, I come back, I go into it. It's no problems. It doesn't need to be redone every single day. In my opinion, it's a waste of effort. We're different. But does my wife have to love God? Deal breaker. Of course. Does my wife have to want to go to church with me? 100%. It's not negotiable. Does she going to want to baptize my kids Coptic Orthodox? Yeah. Not anywhere else. I don't care. So there's some things that you can't compromise on. We have to be compatible in certain things. You have to be compatible with your faith. It's the most important thing in your life. What's more important than your faith? It doesn't make sense to me to say, oh, I'll go uh, you know, marry a Hindu girl, and um, like she'll go Hindu, I'll go Coptic, like what? No, you can't. not compatible. It's the most important thing in your life. Either she becomes Christian, or he go, he go become Hindu or something. I don't know. You have to be compatible in certain things that are, are deal breakers. And, and to me, they are around what is so important to you. And what is the most important thing to you? Your faith. As well as other things, like how you view your career, how you view money how you view family, what values you hold. These are things that are critical to be compatible on. But she likes walking on the beach, you like surfing. It, like, it doesn't really matter if you're not compatible. She likes dogs, you like cats, whatever, man. Yeah? So it's important to be compatible on certain things. What happens when one person from the couple wakes up one day and stops loving the other person, but they're married? So this actually... Is, is, is what I'm talking about with society, yeah? And it's very common. You know, I just don't love you anymore. I have fallen out of love. You're C grade. You're not the person I married, yeah? I just don't love you. I've got no feelings towards you. Why, why can that not happen in our marriages? There's one thing I said that's critical. Marriage is not an emotion. It is a it is a decision. I'm deciding to love you till I am even in heaven. Till death. It's a decision. I can't fall out of love. Because love is a decision. It's laying down one's life. It's not an emotion. Emotions up and down, up and down, up and down. One day I have a, a butterflies in my stomach. One day I want to vomit from you. Like it's 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 not going to work that way. You can't build your marriage on emotions. It's very shaky ground. Nah, marriage is a decision to love, to give, to lay down one's life, to tolerate, to accept. What do you do when your parents are persistently talking about leaving each other, and you try hard to be a peacemaker while they are always harsh to each other? Look, I think, you know, with our parents, I think it's not really our problem. You know, like, they're adults. They can sort their own stuff out, you know. And it's disturbing to, to be involved in problems with parents because they're both your parents. Um, so I, I generally just say, look, just close the door and pray. Try to block out the noise, put on some headphones and hope they stop and pray that they stop. Yeah. Because it's too much to take on. Like it's too much responsibility for a child to take on the problems of their parents. Maybe you can give a like a whisper in a woman's ear and say, Hey, the house has lost a bit of peace lately. Maybe a visit will help us, pray for us. But beyond that, there's not much more you can do, I think. Um, but uh, but it happens, you know, it happens in a lot of in a lot of homes. Um, Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's normal, like, you know, couples argue. Um, and sometimes that's just their way of, of dealing. So don't take it too heavily on yourself. You close the door, block your ears, tell a bonus, sort it out, and focus on finding your own 
pathway for your own lovely marriage moving forward. What happens when a buna intervenes in a serious problem in a relationship and divorce is the only solution? Look, a buna's intervention in a, in a marriage problem is simply to see and to help a process of reconciliation and to provide some counselling. Um, I'll, I'll give you, today, someone walked into my office, a lady. She said, I've decided I'm leaving my husband. And I want you to be there when I tell him. I said, look, first of all, um, you talked to the wrong person. My job is to reconcile, not to separate. If that decision you've made and you don't want to talk about it, it's fine, go ahead and do what you want to do. I'm not going to be there to like, cheer you on for it. My job is to reconcile if it's possible. If it's not, do whatever you want, it's not my business. Yeah, so I'm not going to be there for it. So sometimes it's important to know the priest's role. The priest's role is a reconciliator. He's there to help and to facilitate reconciliation, not to help separation and divorce. Okay? So of course the priest will always try to help, but it requires everyone to be on board. It requires people to, to want the help. You know? And if they want the help, the priest can do a lot of, can, can contribute significantly. But they, it requires everyone to be keen on, on making that peace. When something, what's something you, you wish you knew before getting married? Um, I, I wish, I, I, wish I, um, I knew that how much selflessness is required. You know, because we live, especially in Egyptian families, like we live pretty like selfish lives. Like I don't know about you guys, but like I would wake up in the morning my breakfast is ready on the table. My takeaway coffee is made, and my socks are next to the my breakfast, so that I can put on my socks, have my coffee, my breakfast. The car's on because they need the train station for work. It's all like Mickey Mouse. You guys live like that? That's how I lived. Okay. One time, my mum forgot to put out the socks, <laughs> so I go, "Oh, mum, um, where are the socks?" She goes. And it's all right, Mum. It's all right. Imagine that was my life. Imagine that was my, my next 40 years of my life. Then I get married. I'm like, oh my God, this is completely different. I actually have to care for somebody else. Yeah, I've got to get the kids' socks ready. I've got to make sure my wife is happy. I've got to make sure everyone is okay and well. And all of a sudden, you're not thinking about yourself anymore. You're too busy thinking about your wife, about your children, making sure everyone's okay, everyone's happy. Yeah. Have I told you guys my indoor soccer experience? Yeah. First week of marriage, all right? The boys message me, hey, we're going indoor soccer. You want to come? Okay, yeah, yeah, 100%. See you guys there. <laughs> I go, hey, Gina, I'm going to the indoor. She goes, what? I go, indoor, in the indoor soccer? Yeah, we're going with the boys. She goes, what do you mean? I'm like, you know indoor soccer? <laughs> I'm just going to go with the boys to indoor soccer. She goes, oh, I just, I don't know. I thought you would want to stay with me. I'm like, yeah, like, I do. <laughs> I'm just going to go indoor soccer and come back and stay with you. <laughs> she goes, okay, yeah, all right, go. <coughs> all right, boys, I can't come to indoor soccer. <laughs> like, I'm like, what, what's going on? <laughs> That's what I, w I wish someone told me is that all of a sudden it's no longer about you. It's about somebody else. Make sure somebody else is happy. Yeah? Will the priest ever suggest to end the marriage? Um, I think if, if the priest feels, see something along the lines of uh, domestic violence, uh, someone is unsafe, somebody's being abused, um, then yeah, the priest, he, the priest, you know, he, he cares for everyone as though they're his children. So if he sees one of his daughters um, being hurt or abused, or the priest will say, get out of that environment. Don't stay like that. Yeah. So yeah, there are situa extreme situations which yeah, a priest would suggest that. What are, are reasons a marriage can be annulled, and, and how is this different to divorce? 
the real simply speaking is is the government side of thing. You know when you get married, you get you get two certificates. One is the government's and one is the church's. Yeah? Divorce is the government area. You have to go and you have to submit to the government that you are now divorced, this marriage is ended, etc. etc. You divide your assets, blah blah blah. The church has nothing to do with that. Again, if someone calls a priest, I want to speak to them, they want to give me 40%, but I want 50%. Good luck, man. We have nothing to do with that. It's none of our business. Yeah? So what the church does is it comes to the sacrament that it has performed. And it just needs to decide, is there valid reason for this divorce, this separation? If so, then uh, an absolution is given for remarriage. That's all it comes down to. Yeah, no. I guess that's what that's what's meant by hereby annulled. So this 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 unity that the church has performed, the, the church would then declare that this unity um, has been somewhat broken um, and is now given permission for another um, union to take place. Um, but it's not necessarily um, like, for example, someone when they lose their partner to death um, and they marry another person. Um, it's not like that needs anything to happen because death is what separated the physical um, union here on earth. Um, so there's no particular prayer or ritual that needs to take place to end one and start another. But it is simply saying that there is enough reason here to say that this union that took place um, has now been broken and so and there's good reason for this person to be able to have another chance at marriage. Yeah? So what are the reasons a marriage can be annulled and how is it different to divorce? So, yeah, so basically the, the, the church will do that in extreme reasons and, and they're not that many, like it's adultery, um, violence, abuse. Um, and the church is also a bit more pastoral. So the church can assess like what's taken place. Every scenario is different. And the church can assess were there factors involved here that warrant this person having another chance at marrying somebody else. Yeah. It's tricky ground, you know, it's very tricky ground. I'm glad I'm not involved in it. There, there are some priests that are involved in it, but the reason it's so tricky, on one sense, you want to give people a chance of starting fresh. You know, you, you've married someone, you've realized that you're totally not compatible, totally not working, everyone's miserable, um, but nothing dramatic's happened. We have no violence, there's no adultery, there's no nothing. Like, from a pastoral perspective, you look at that and you want to say, you just give them, you wish you could give them another chance to find someone right, yeah? But at the same time, you have the words of Christ that says what well, God has joined, let no man separate. And you have what is so sacred that you don't want to just, yeah, it didn't work, or I go find someone else. Yeah? At the same time, you don't make it so easy that everyone just goes, oh yeah, I don't like her, I'll just get married again. So it is, it is very tricky space for the church yeah um you don't want to end up in that space you don't want to be there because of how complicated and tricky it is um so i guess these talks are, are geared towards you hearing it now nice and early to make the right decisions when searching for a partner you make the right decisions with prayer with guidance focusing on the right things you'll make the right decision having spiritual and God's kingdom in, in front of you, um, you'll make a wonderful decision. You'll be happy. Does the Coptic Orthodox Church allow divorce on the grounds of emotional cheating with others or just physical cheating? So like I said, it, it's case-by-case case, uh, scenario. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is a group of clergy and there's a bishop involved and, and, and they sit down and they assess what's taken place. And with their spiritual discretion, 
they need to make a decision. Um, there isn't a list of, okay, emotional uh, cheating that's acceptable, physical cheating is not acceptable. Th there isn't, it's not black and white like that. Um, it, is, it is case by case scenario. Um, but again, you don't want to be there, you know. Um, make the right decision and you won't end up in that space. Would a priest ever tell a couple who's about to get married that they should break up if he sees that the relationship is very toxic? You know, I, I think with, with the priests, they're, they're, not that, um, they're not that controlling. You know, and, and priests um, have to be very careful about, um, I, I want to say the word power that they have, but that's not the exactly right word I'm trying to find. Um, the authority, perhaps. Um, so what a priest says um, is not he's not a controlling person to say, be with this person, leave this person. A priest doesn't control your life like that. And it shouldn't. But what the priest will do is to help you interpret situations. Yeah? So you come, a girl comes to Abuna and says, Abuna, I don't know, but every time we fight, like he yells at me and I get scared. So Abuna will say, look, that's a concerning part of your relationship. I need to think about how that would play out in marriage. Yeah, um, do you feel secure and safe? And these are feelings that you need to have before stepping into a marriage. See the difference? He's not going to say, "Yeah, man, get out of there, break up, you're out." Like he says, "Danger zone." But he'll make you think about that. Yeah, to for you to make your own decision. Um, so that that's the role of of the priest as a father, as a father would. He would um, guide you to, to think through things like that. Um, I think I've got them all. Yeah? Anything else from that's come up in your minds <coughs> besides all of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, what you've just said is describing um, how a null will take place when something was hidden. Say, for example, there was um, a, a serious historical event or a serious sickness that was hidden, and then it was revealed later, and so the annulment was based on the fact that well, the union never took place properly because there were things that were not revealed, yeah? Um, and that, that's uh, one scenario. But there are also scenarios of things that, Everything was clear, but then they played out in a way that was bad afterwards. Um, so in that case, this church can still say that this separation is now um, deemed um, the cancel the union and give the chance for the next union to take place. Yeah. All good? Everyone's happy? I feel like I need to let you guys leave on a happier note. I don't know how to do it, I'm trying to think. Like. Yeah. Oh, here we go, favorite thing about marriage, okay. Oh, hmm. You know, I, I think people really find themselves um, in family. You know, you find, uh, you see yourself in a new way. Like the guys, yeah? Now you're just a dude, yeah? Once you're married, I'm a provider. <laughs> a father. People are depending on me. I work and I provide and I'm there and I accomplish, I do. Yeah, and I get a home and I start and I buy a house and I get a loan and I build this and I, and I set up my kids' future and I'm like, and you're interacting with them, and you're raising them. So you, you, you find yourself in this environment. And same for the girls. Just now you're, um, you're a chick. But then all of a sudden, you find yourself a supportive wife. 
and a nurturing mother, and you're carrying within you a human being that's growing within you, and you, f you, you find yourself. Yeah? So I think, I think one of the beautiful things about marriage is that you, you see yourself in a new light. You step into the role and you really enjoy it. Yeah? That ma marriage is beautiful. To share life, to share love, to, to lay down yourself for another, to be selfless, to be focused on God's kingdom, to support each other through the good times and the bad times, to be there for one another, to start a family, to have... Yeah, it's beautiful. We're talking here about a few exceptions when something goes wrong down the track. But what happens when you make the right decisions now, you minimize the chance that will happen. When you have your eyes focused on God's kingdom, you're minimizing the chance that will happen. When you choose someone that you're aligned with, you minimize that chance of happening. Yeah? So we're all good here. We're all good here. It's beautiful. All right? Thank you so much for having me, Lord. Glory be to God for everyone there. Thank you, Abuna, for joining us tonight. Just a few announcements. Um, tomorrow night we have book club <laughs> at 7.45. We're reading The Great Lent and Me by Abuna Bishoy Kamo. That's what Bishoy told me to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bible studies Wednesday, 7.30. Mass Friday, like normal, 5.45 to 7.30 a.m. Um, we also have an extra mass on Tuesday. 3.30 to 6 p.m. Um, we also have SYC, which is from the 25th to the 27th of March. Prices for Sydney people are $76, and if you want discounted flights, um, the group discount ends tonight. Sorry. Oh, it's in Melbourne. <laughs> Any other announcements? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it. Please stay seated for a photo. <laughs> Can everyone like come in? We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for bringing us this evening into your holy church. We thank you, our dear Lord, for the sacrament that you've given us through the church, these beautiful graces that you give us. We especially, Lord, thank you for the grace of the sacrament of marriage. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown us the ultimate way with your love, your sacrifice, and your laying down your life for us, the church. We ask God that we would aspire to have marriages that reflect this. We ask you, Lord, for the youth that are present, the ones that are married, that you bless their marriage, that you guide them together towards the kingdom. The ones that are not, we ask well, that you guide them to the right person who would share this journey towards your kingdom. We ask, Lord, that all of our new generation, all of our marriages would all have marriages that are beautiful, fulfilling, loving, selfless, full of happiness, and that you would keep away from us the temptation of any misery or divorce. We ask you, our dear Lord, for your blessing for this church, that you always 
bless them with the spirit of revival, always allowing them to see the fruits of their labour. We ask your Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would bless for us this Lenten period that we are in, that it will be a time which we will draw closer to you and to your church, where you would reveal yourself to us more and more. Keep our eyes and our hearts on you and on your kingdom in everything that we do, in every day that we live. Have mercy upon us, Lord, and hear our prayers for the intercessions of all your saints, our Holy Mother, St. Mary, as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom power. And in the name of the love of God the Father, the grace of God and Son, the youth, the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.